Dramatic, dramatic backlighting. Wow, wow, wow. Hi everyone, I'm Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator here at the Writer's House and we're so excited to have Nina McLaughlin here. She is a Penn alum, 01, uh, majored in <laughs> classics and English. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Um, and after a stint at the Boston Phoenix, a now defunct alt paper, RIP. RIP uh, to the max. To all of them. Yeah. Let's all mourn <laughs> the end of it's the sad. alt weeklies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the the to the wind of all of all the people who used to work at them. Um, but uh, after that, worked as a carpenter and wrote a truly wonderful book about it hammerhead which we have for sale out there Thanks. and worked for nine years as a carpenter and then wrote this amazing ovid retelling wake siren uh let's all welcome her thanks you guys thanks um uh so i was just saying i have not been back on campus since i graduated i've been back in philadelphia but not back on campus and it's feeling quite surreal and I, I had mixed feelings about my experience at Penn, but the Kelly Writer's House was like the one kind of anchor and home for me. So it really is like a pleasure to be back here. Um, I'm going to read you guys a quick bit to start. Um, as Ali said, it's a, <clears throat> it's a retelling of Ovid's Metamorphosis told from the perspective of the female figures who are transformed. And... Um, the one I'm going to read you uh, is the story of Pygmalion, and that's uh, a myth that's been sort of told and retold many, many, many times. Um, the sort of broad strokes plot of it is that he carves a woman out of stone, um, and then she comes to life. Um, and it's sort of, I mean, Pinocchio is a Pygmalion story, My Fair Lady, um, the really excellent 1987 film Mannequin. Um, which I loved as a kid. Greatest film about Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh, it's in Philadelphia. It's in Philadelphia. No kidding. Wanamaker. Oh. She's a mannequin. Wow. Wanamaker. Yeah. Um, early Kim Cattrall. Um, so this is um, this is that story. <clears throat> Pygmalion hated women. He thought they were disgusting. Their voices, their laughs, their hairs, the way they sweat, smelled, stepped. You Cyprian women get so wet, he said. What's with that? No one told him. No one told him what the wetness was. So it don't hurt. Because we like it. A way of saying, getting there. A way of saying, ready. A way of saying, more. A welcome, a compliment, an invitation. Between the fingers, it spreads like thread, a glow, a word, silm, the shimmer. You know how lucky to feel that from a woman on your knees. The rivers, the ocean, <clears throat> the rain, tear fall. The rivers that do not make it to the sea. The ocean that's absorbed again by the skin, wash of brine on the body. The rain before it reaches the earth to evaporate, tear fall, unfallen, detour the moisture. But it's not like water at all, moves better than blood. It's got its own light, and the light is a mystery. Have you ever even made out with a mango? You feel it on the inside of the thighs and not know what sort of prize that is. That's another thing entire when it gets to the legs. What's with that? There's so much that we want, and otherwise we drown. You Cyprian women get so wet, disgust dripping off his tongue, so he carved one dry as stone. Oof, you're perfect, he cooed. She's mute as he groped her ivory breast. He claps necklaces around her neck, beads and jewels between her breasts. He placed her in his bed, stiff. Under the covers, he warmed the stone cold toes, he'd say. Women knew he hated women. Women know when a man hates women. It hides in their smiles. It hides in the smiles of surprise each time a woman shows she's funny, strong, or wise. The men who hate women are surprised at this. Pygmalion hated women, 
and all the women knew. A man who hates women builds one with a juicy ass and giant tits and no belly and a face that's foreign and empty and dumb. And when Pygmalion begged Venus to make her real, and Venus granted his request and put moving blood in her body and gave her breasts that squished if you grip them, we teased her, but only because we wanted to make her know. Where's your stretch marks, sweetheart? Where's your period? Where's your laugh? Don't you laugh? Where's the one hair at your nipple? Where's the flesh crease on your back? Where's your smell, sweetheart? Don't you smell, sweetheart? Where's the strength in your legs? Where's the muscles in your shoulders? Where's the wetness? Where's the rivers, oceans, rain, tear fall? Where's your power, sweetheart? We'll tell you, sweetheart. It's in you, sweetheart, all over you. It fills every curve and swell. Find it, sweetheart. Know it, sweetheart. He doesn't make you who you are. Time separated her from her statue life. Smell this, she'd say, and lift her arm. We laughed. You got it, ivory girl. You stink. She sweat and seeped like all of us, less perfect every day. There's nothing duller than perfection, she'd learn. Really, it's a myth. That's right. We loved her more and more. There is no love in loving the ideal. Piggy doesn't love me. He loves an idea in his brain. Piggy is a shit. She knew it. We're made of mess, she said. Sweetheart, yes. That's exactly what we're made of. Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so these are feminist forward, women centered retellings of Ovid. Uh, why revisit these stories, especially ones that have been seen, sort of explored so many times? You know, uh, yeah, that's a, a really reasonable question and a good one. I, it's, when I started working on this, I, I had just sort of ended the carpentry work and I was trying to get my writing muscles back in shape. Um, and I was sort of looking through the metamorphosis at the time as I do periodically when I sort of, when other books aren't landing, I just think it's like a, just a beautiful book that you can kind of pick up anywhere. <clears throat> and I was just like, oh, well, I'll just try writing this from a different perspective. And it felt, it felt really good. It just felt like, right? And I was like, all right, well, I'll try another. I'll try another. And it just like very quickly was just like this, this total outpouring. So in some ways, it wasn't this conscious decision of like, okay, now is when I write a book retelling the metamorphosis uh, from female perspectives. It was just like, God, this something sort of happened um, in like, honestly, kind of a physical way, it almost felt like. Um, and I just I just kind of like wrote it out. And was it hard? Most of the stories are, are pretty not most, but many of them pretty rough. Was it hard to sort of get in that space over and over and over again? You know, it's funny. I, I, so I, I wrote it quickly. It took three months to write. Um, <clears throat> and I did a spell check, sent it off to my agent and didn't read it over. Hadn't told anyone I was, I was working on it. Um, and when I, so it sold and I got the first round of edits back and reading over it, I had like, I had essentially no recollection of writing it. So it was this extremely bizarre experience of like being confronted with the violence. Like I think as I was working on it, I was not aware. Like it just was like, it really did feel like it was coming from a different place. Um, and so the, the experience of reading it fully over for the first time was like deeply uncomfortable, you know? Like really just like, wow, like this is the sort of, it's, it's, it was like someone had pulled back the curtain on parts of my brain that, you know, I'm not used to engaging with, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really remarkable book and sort of each experience is really preserved on its own, but as a, as a wash. Mm, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot. And did you sort of feel the same way when you were reading Ovid? originally was it interesting. the same kind of sensation do you think you know that's that's interesting it's funny you know i studied classics here and had done a lot of in high school as well but had never read the metamorphosis and um it was actually working on the second draft of hammerhead uh and i was like okay i want to be reading something that isn't kind of like isn't going to sort of infect what i'm working on isn't going to sort of influence 
the rhythms or the sort of ideas. And, and it ended up being sort of the backbone of Hammerhead, this idea of transformation, this idea of change, sort of one thing becoming something else. Um, and that initial read through really was a very, again, sort of the strange time in my life. I had no internet. I was sort of isolated and would just read the metamorphosis every night after dinner. And it did feel like this, mm, like very connected reading experience. Yeah, so that's, and I hadn't thought about that. That's, so that's, I mean, that's a cool, uh, yeah, a cool question also. And I want to get back to that idea of <laughs> transformation in Hammerhead, uh, but just in a, in a context with Wake Siren, um, classics are back. Is that like <laughs> kind of a weird thing to say? Uh, you know, we have the Emily Wilson translation mm -hmm. and she's here, which right. is awesome. Um, we actually read the whole thing at the writer's house last wow, year. Wow, cool. Out loud. That was really also an intense wash to do totally. orally, but wow. very neat. Um, and then we've got Song of Achilles and, yep. and Circe. And so do you think, what do you think is appealing about it now? Not asking you to defend classics right, in right. the contemporary times, but what do you think makes it so so easy to return to now? Sure. I think, I think with these stories, um, I think these stories actually live in our bodies. I really think these stories that they aren't just sort of things that we sort of know uh, in a mental way, I think we really absorb these kind of fundamental myths in in our actual physical selves, um, and I think that's like that's not just like the sort of Western sort of you know Greek and Roman stuff. I think that's that's across cultures, um, and I think that in some ways that it's like these these stories are always alive. Um, I haven't. I admit I haven't read Circe or any of the Madeline Miller stuff, um, uh, which maybe I shouldn't admit. I'm not sure, um, but I think that like there being space, you know, for these different perspectives and different voices um, to come in and sort of take more ownership of some of these stories that have been told from a sort of male point of view for so long um, does feel like this kind of I don't know necessary and powerful act um and i think a lot about this sort of idea of translation and emily wilson is great about this um i was thinking about the sirens and she was talking about how there's a moment i mean there's like in the odyssey like the sirens episode is like 15 lines it's a tiny episode and yet they sort of occupy such a big part of the imagination and the way that people men historically were translating um one line was something like honeyed song poured forth from their lips, 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 always lips. And in fact, she was saying the word is mouth. Like that, like there's no denying in, in Latin, it's like the word is, or Greek, Greek, the word is mouth. Um, and that lips is a much sexier word. And so these, like on the word level, it's these choices sort of sink in and impact how we know these stories. And I think sort of, what what she's doing with translation, what some of these stories are doing, is sort of saying like, okay, like there's 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 space for more perspectives. Do you think that there's any sort of outlying um, Greek or, or Latin texts that are just waiting now? Oh wow, good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, they're all so rich. Do you have, do you have friends? I, I don't. And I don't want to steal, you know, like you can, you can bank that for later. Yeah. 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 You need to write a follow up. Yeah. That's, right. That's yours. Uh, <laughs> Wake Siren 2. <laughs> Return of the Sirens. <laughs> um, but I also think it's funny sort of contextually and timeline wise. Like I think it's really the past five years, mm -hmm. six years that you get this return. Well, when I was younger, I think it was like, classics as like murder pact like i'm thinking oh. about like um uh like secret history or mm -hmm. um special topics in calamity physics i think oh, they're right. both like wow, yeah. they're both like murder pack classic major books like wow oh i had no idea gosh okay it's yeah. like a weird it's a it's a strange and that's obviously kind of like a meta thing because it's about the people who are studying that sort of uh -huh. going out and murder packing i don't know why that was like wow. a weird mode yeah two is not a trend no though. but that's i mean that's still like no, More than none. It's yes. It's not zero murder yeah. pack <laughs> stories. Um, <laughs> so, like returning to this idea of transformation, um, Wake Siren, uh, fiction, this retelling, 
here we have a nonfiction story that's very much about both your transformation and about transforming sort of materials. Mm-hmm. And what what caused you to write it in the first place? Like, why is it like I got I have to get these thoughts down? And yeah. then some some more about like what was it like to sort of transform your experience into the book? Sure. Um, so. The way the book came about, I had never sort of anticipated writing a, a nonfiction book. Um, and um, basically an, an editor approached me and said, would you, would you be interested in writing this? And this was, this was like an exciting email to get because all I wanted to do in my life is be a writer. Um, and so, you know, when I was first learning carpentry and I really went into it knowing nothing, like barely knowing how to read a tape measure. So I was taking the only way I knew how to how to learn from college, from being a journalist, was like taking notes. And so I was just like taking a ton of notes as I was sort of learning these different skills. You know, it would be like, my boss would just like, I, you know, she'd be like trying to do something with a saw and I'd be like, okay, okay, that's, and she would just be like, oh, what are you doing, you know? Um, and then, so f- first, f- like I sort of learned that like, this is not work that you learn by writing it down, you learn it by doing it and getting it wrong and screwing it up over and over again. And, um, and so I started taking notes just like on the atmosphere and who we were working for and what we were doing. Um, and so it was sort of writing about it just to make sense of it in my own mind, because it, for me, it was quite jarring to be like, I understood myself as a journalist, you know, and then to be like, when people be like, oh, so what are you up to? Have this kind of shrugging, like, well, gosh, I left my journalism job and now I'm working as a carpenter. Who knows? Um, and so it took a while for me to be able to say like, yes, like this is like this is what I'm up to. Um, and so the tricky part of the book was in some ways, I mean, it was like I was writing it as I was living it, you know, it's sort of the, the book sort of follows the first like three years. Um, and I was writing it. I mean, gosh, it was like it wasn't like, oh, I have, you know, 15 years of digesting this experience. Um, it was kind of making sense of it as it was happening. Um, and it was compelling to me in the sense of, you know, as someone who lives a lot of my life in my brain and sort of deals with words a lot, the carpentry work, the work with physical materials was such a beautiful balance, you know, to the word life. Um, and I, and I do miss it sometimes. I've been carving spoons, um, as kind of antidote to, to the words, which I would recommend to everyone. Um, it's beautiful spoons. Oh, thanks. That's nice. That's nice. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah. So that just got derailed. So that's. I mean, I'm not quite sure if I answered your question. No, I think that's definitely uh, interesting, and it leads to like a thought that I was having when I was reading the book, just about labor, like about mm. what work is. Mm. So when you're working on carpentry, you know, you describe your experience, and it's very like satisfying in a way that particularly the kind of journalism that you do when you're working for an alt weekly the like eventsy stuff yeah, right. the posting of things the very like flow of a work day is taxing in one way that's very mental without being challenging completely um while while obviously like this kind of hands-on labor is taxing physically and mentally but in a completely different way right right so what was it like to shift those kinds of work and then to shift a third time to fiction writing which is like right like neither of those things at all right right yeah so it's I mean it's it's funny I mean to speak to the idea of satisfaction it's like I write a lot and would sort of think like you know there will be moments usually right after I finish and I'll be like genius great and it's this like very fleeting moment where it's like wow I'm, I'm like good at this and this is feels right on and, that's, and then it goes away very quickly and with the stuff that we built it was like oh not only is this the best deck that we've built this is the best deck that's ever existed in the history of decks you know there was just this like wow this is incredible um and that didn't go away you know the, the satisfaction was not fleeting um uh and so the idea of then shifting towards fiction, I mean, I guess when I was young, I sort of always thought I would write fiction. So in some ways it felt it felt natural. Um, what feels, again, sort of the trick has been like, now that life has been sort of less, you know, I'm like 
working more, writing all the time, not having that balance of the physical work. Like it's a lot of time alone sort of with my own brain, which is challenging at times. Um, uh, in some ways, like the writing part, it's almost like, I guess the way I feel about it in some ways is that like fiction or nonfiction, the writing feels like a very essential, maybe the most essential part of myself. Um, so it doesn't feel like that shift to fiction didn't feel like, oh, now now this other transformation. It felt consistent, sort of in line with, with how I understand myself. Um, and the carpentry felt like this kind of, you know, this, this veering and it feels like stuff that I'll do whether I'm getting paid to go into someone else's house um, that I'll do for the rest of my life, you know? Just that it feels like, again, a balancer. And did you find, um, another thing about the ways in which certain kinds of work drain you, did you find it was easier to turn around and write at the end of a day of physical labor or a day of the sort of computer-based, oh, like, yeah. locked into the oh, screen God. type yeah. of work. Totally. I mean, like, there was a, there's a, like, a, like, a, a certain level, you guys have probably all experienced this in, in different ways, like, there's a certain, like, feeling, I think, of, like, brain crispiness that happens if you're just kind of, like, plugged into the internet all day and just kind of, like, grinding away at your computer, um, which did not make for a very fruitful or creative feeling life. Um, and, you know, with the carpentry work, like, I would, be physically tired, but a much sort of more expansive and creative feel. Um, uh, and and so, you know, it was like, I, I wouldn't necessarily come home from like eight hours of like schlepping heavy stuff upstairs to like be like, all right, here we go. Um, but you know, when I more, like the work allowed space in my mind for the, the sort of creative energy and the thought having that I associate with with the best part of writing. Awesome. And so in a kind of strangely literal way, your dad, who does woodwork, mm -hmm. but is his, his hobby is making these these animal decoys, yeah. these like ducks and mm -hmm. cranes. Did you get your crane? No, I never will. I never <laughs> will. Um, is transforming wood into animals very much like oh, wow. the gods are sort of transforming yeah. and creating things? Is that sort of myth building, myth making, and physical making? Like how how do you think that's like seeped into your your work? Totally. Wow, I love this question. Like, so I think I mean the idea of so I just I just finished this spoon made out of sycamore, and I don't know if you guys have been to Cambridge. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard Square, and there's um, there's a stretch along. Memorial Drive that's like lined with these giant beautiful sycamore trees and I was coming back from a run and there was a, a limb that had fallen down so I grabbed it and brought it home and made this spoon and like <laughs> as you do I guess totally and, normal yeah. activity <laughs> and it's this feeling of like man like it's this intimate relationship with the piece of wood and so it's like it's thinking about like okay this was this magnificent tree that's been there for I'm gonna guess at least a hundred years, who knows? Um, and then it's it's in my kitchen, and I'm sawing a piece of it, and it's in my hands, and I'm making it into a spoon. And I don't think it's like, it's not resurrecting it, but it's it's sort of like engaging in this act of transformation. Now it's a tool, you know. Um, and there's something so. I think profound and I like reveal myself to be a complete hippie. I feel like when I say this sort of thing, but like it really is profound to be kind of in conversation with the force of the tree, you know, that there is this like this ongoing, yeah, change, you know, and if like if I hadn't grab that limb, you know, it would have like rotted and sort of turned back to earth. Like all this stuff is so, I don't know, like beautiful and compelling to me. I think you wrote, maybe it was the Lit Hub essay that mm. you wrote um, about sort of that, that feeling with the natural world. Like um, one of the stories, and, I'm, and I apologize because I'm, I'm blanking my knowledge of the gods is Yeah, I forget all that too. Uh, but um, there's a tree, the tree was once a, once a woman, um, 
and sort of the, the connection between those things, right. how like you have that mm-hmm. that spirit that you're you're pulling, and you shouldn't necessarily go around kicking trees because right. they might have once been people. <laughs> right. Um, and so is that that's something that is in your mind? Do you think though it's obviously it's a story from a mythology that maybe we don't worship anymore? Mm-hmm. But do you think that's still in your mind when you're? Yeah, definitely. And it's like I think you can still kick trees, but I think that it's just this sort of awareness. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, yeah. in case you were worried. <laughs> go about your tree kicking um but i think yeah but it it like deepens it has deepened my sense of uh, yeah that sort of my relationship to the natural world like there's just like you just the 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 story that ali's talking about is is this idea this this woman who gets turned to a tree sort of warns her baby son like or warns the father sort of don't let him pluck any flowers you don't like any bush could be the body of a goddess and i so i think like there you like I don't know I mean whether you fully whether I fully believe like okay yes this this could be like a person this sycamore branch or these like acorns like it's almost that it's that's less relevant than sort of like the like the 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 potential you know the sort of like could be and the sort of force regardless of whether it's an actual like former whatever human nymph ghost whatever just the sort of like the energy inside of it um, <laughs> which like, again, I feel kind of shy saying, but uh, it certainly has changed the way I move around the city and I moved around the natural world and deepened my relationship to like trees and flowers and plants and the sky and all of it. And the wood. Yeah, and the wood, completely the wood, totally, <laughs> totally. Um, now, just that you have all this carpeting experience, the book closes with you building the shelves for your dad. Mm. Do you, are you sort of constantly being, like, your labor's being requested by friends and family, like, come, come repair my, my tile work? Yeah, yeah, less so now, for sure, less so now, um, and it's tricky, it's tricky working for friends, um, uh, I've done, I've done some of it, and it always ends up being, like, a little more complicated, unless things are very clear, because, again, what you, like, to speak to your question about labor, it is, work you know and there I reached a certain point with writing that it was like okay you know I spent a lot of time writing for free you know because just like maybe you did too like it's just like whatever just that's how it sort of starts and then I reached finally a point where I was like okay I don't I don't write for free anymore you know and with the carpentry too it's like all right this is hard work and this is my time you know and it's it's those exchanges can be can be difficult and what would you say to someone uh, looking like women are radically underrepresented mm, in the trades. Mm. It's what like two point five percent of all mm-hmm. trades work is are women yep. identify as women. Um, what would you say, like if you had known that this was a possibility? I'm not saying that you would have like signed up for carpentry right. apprenticeships right. as a youth, but what do you think the pathway is to sort of doing that more to get more women involved? Yeah. God, is there one? Yeah. That's a really good question. And it's something I don't feel like I have a great answer to it, you know, because it's the way that I sort of found my way into it felt so defined by luck, you know, that it was just like, wow, like to be connected with this, this woman who was my sort of mentor and teacher, she was just amazing. And, um, I think the way I thought, thought about it eventually was that like if you don't see women in the trades it doesn't seem like an option the same way like if you never saw a woman as a doctor if you never saw a woman as you know it's just like it doesn't feel like an option and so the more women do it the more it can feel like oh this is that's a possibility for me too which I don't think feels at this point I don't think it necessarily it doesn't feel like an automatic option for most girls. Um, and in terms of how to change that, I, you know, it's like, I really don't know, like more sort of like women only trade schools. Um, I think that would be, you know, and I will say like the Craigslist ad that I answered for this carpentry gig said women in- strongly encouraged to apply. Had it not said that there's no chance I would have responded, you know, like, um, so I think, I don't know, yeah, I think that the that, that idea of sort of giving more young women access to the education involved. Um, if you could have, so there's a there are couple points at which, like when you're looking for jobs in, in Hammerhead after you quit the Phoenix, um, 
you know, you sort of floated at resumes and applied yeah. to other things. Obviously, like, the the book worked out and <laughs> you're back to writing. But do you... Are you glad that this is the path that you chose? Do you wish maybe, like, what if instead Boston Globe had called right, the next right. day and said, oh, come be our book's columnist now? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally glad that it worked out like this. I mean, this, I mean, that's to, to like the, the globe calling and saying like, please come, come, come be our books person. I mean, that would have been sweet and expected, you know, like not expected, but just like, that would have been like a sense making yeah. next step. Um, whereas this, like this kind of this real veering, um, didn't make a lot of sense. And I think that uh, and like was really challenging in a lot of different ways. And I think that it made me know that, I don't know, when I was younger, I used to think like, if you make a decision, like this is the, you've locked yourself in for the rest of your life, you know? So decisions were quite hard for me because it was like, oh God, this is it for forever. Um, but in fact, like, no, again, I mean, gosh, to go back to ideas of change, like there's always room to change, you know? And I feel like as a young person, you know, here actually studying sort of like, okay, like, what you're doing now can play out in so many different ways throughout your life. And it's sort of, I don't think you reach a point where that goes away. I think there's always the possibility to say like, all right, like whether it's like a, the, like the place you're living, whether it's the relationship you're in, whether it's like your, your, your work, I think there's always room to shift. That's beautiful. Um, do you want to read maybe one more piece, you can, another sure. favorite section, and then we'll take some questions from you? Oh, yes. Okay, let's see. Um, I'll read. This is another sort of, yeah, shortish one. This is um, the story of Echo, which is um, uh, basically Echo fell in love with Narcissus, who was in love with his reflection, and so she, in her desperation and sadness, retreated to a cave um, and sort of disappeared into the cave, into the stone, and sort of became what we now understand to be Echo's. Um, in this story, it's the one story that is um, voiced from one of the sort of main gods, and this is in the voice of Juno, um, otherwise known as Hera, who is the wife of Jove, otherwise known as Zeus. Um, and so Zeus slash Jove, um, it's just like, I mean, he's a, he's a bad dude, always like always boning the nymphs. And, um, at first like, so, and so Juno is responsible for a lot of the transformations that take place. Like she is the one that's sort of vengeful and will sort of say like, you know, Jove seduced you, like now you become a rock, you know? Um, and so I was thinking, wow, Juno is such a jerk, but in fact then got some sympathy for her. Um, and so this is in the voice of Echo, uh, I mean, voice of Juno telling Echo's story. I know my power. I know the way I shift the energy of any room I enter, the heat and light that comes off of me. I know it, look at me. The command of my height, the spread of my shoulders, I stand with strength. I am immortal. See the swell and lift of my breasts, nipples that press against the saffron robe that drapes my body like it was painted on my flesh. Do you see? Not just beautiful, powerful. The sweeping rise of my throat, the warmth and ferocity of my mouth, the wide bones of my skull, the swell and lift of my cheeks, skin, the color of coconut flesh. Actually, I'm going to interrupt. When I was writing this, I was imagining Tilda Swinton, um, but like a nine foot tall Tilda Swinton. Um, blonde white hair that sweeps like a cresting wave of, of wave above my forehead, my cheeks flushed, and my eyes hold every moonrise and the spark and current of every ounce of menstrual blood released from all the women who bleed. I am for the women, don't you see? But there are so many, and they are so new, and they are so tempting for my Jove, my beloved, who cannot resist young women, who cannot resist the nymphs. Like Semele, a child, really, with her black hair that felt straight around her jaw, her big, young, sad, dumb eyes, her open, trusting smile. 
She had no idea the bad news situation she'd found herself in. And if it had just been some simple one-time lay, fine, forgive, forget, but she got pregnant, he made her pregnant, and to see her aglow, belly swelling, his immortal seed growing inside her mortal body, I could not have it. Her? Not me? Why? The answers my brain offers are a catalog of my own failings. Have I gone stale? Is he no longer attracted to my body, tall and lean? Has familiarity fogged his ability to see me? Am I invisible to him across the breakfast table in our shared bed? Have I disappeared? Am I not funny? Am I too powerful? Is my hair too blonde, too short? Would it be better if I had longer hair? Has the shared bone that is the marriage bond grown brittle over this long spread of time? Am I too much a given? What's wrong with me? So I disguised myself as Semele's old nurse and we chatted about this and that and I slipped in, my dear. So young, perhaps you do not know the ways of men. So many of them deceive you. If you want to know if the man who visits your bed is Jove himself, you've got to ask him to prove it to you. Ask him to show himself to you the way he shows himself to Juno. It's the only way you'll know. One cannot see the true face of a god and live. I knew this meant her death, and so it did. Is it fair that she's a heap of ash, gritty with bits of her bones? Of course it's not. But what am I supposed to do with the anger? I share my life with him. Are these women to blame? It's not a question I can spend my time answering. Punishing them, watching them die, it's one way to let out the anger. But it brings me no relief. One gone, he finds another, and it happens again, again, again. These poor women, but this poor me. Someone has to pay. I watched Semele burn. It brought me no relief. An echo, too, you have to understand one cannot deceive a goddess and expect life to go on as normal. I'd know Jove was down carousing, getting handsy with the nymphs, and I couldn't help but follow, even though I knew I was following a path that led directly toward more pain. An echo, who never lay with Jove, who had curly hair and a funny laugh, would come and talk with me. I admit. I enjoyed her conversation. She'd tell me about the gossip of the woods, the mischief of the satyrs, the parties, and she'd laugh her funny laugh and look around, and I thought maybe it was nerves from talking to me. But it was not that. She was playing me for a fool, talking in my ear, not because she liked me, but so her nymphette friends would have time enough to scatter, to not get caught with my Jove's wide palm groping at their breasts. There is no one on my team. So I took away her talk. All she can do is repeat the words that others say. And when I watched her fall for Narcissus, that self-loving twit, drowning in the depths of his own empty reflection, it did not make me happy. It brought me no relief. I watched her chase him, throw her voice his way every time he spoke. I watched her life force drain out of her as she retreated to a cave, rejected, alone, from body to bone to stone at the floor of a cave and her sad voice bouncing off the hills. This is one form the crushing of love can take. Mine takes another. I take revenge the way I can. I could no more murder my immortal husband than carve a hole into the sky. And I understand him. He cannot resist fresh adoration, needs attention. I know he is weak, and his weakness makes me tender, and it makes me so angry I can barely see. My Jove, my love, my husband, my brother, my king, my thunderer, oh, my lightning bolt, my wild, mighty God, you own me, I am yours, my golden shafted swan, my woolly bull, my broad-backed lamb, you know you are. I take your eagle in my mouth, I know you like it. Oh, my animal, you who share my blood, my bed, my life eternally, give me your thunderbolt, all of it into me, my Jove, my love, my horny fucking husband, my hungerer, my betrayer, my endless source of sorrow and rage, my bottomless well of pain, my pathetic, 
useless liar. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. That's that's an abrupt kind of like change of pace. To, yeah, I know it's it's <laughs> awesome, and it's um, it's it's amazing to read on your own. It's a lot more intense when now you're imagining Tilda Swinton <laughs> saying all of these things yeah. as a nine foot tall yeah. goddess. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, though, if any at any moment you have one, okay. For for pros- you talked a, a minute about your youth, but when you were very young, did you picture yourself as a writer or as a carpenter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually remember the moment I was in third grade when I when I was like, oh man, like I want to be a writer. Um, I I'd always, I mean, you know, there's always I loved reading as a kid all the time. My parents read to us all the time. Um, but we had to in third grade we had to write these little books, these little stories, and I was writing about a giant. And I kept using the word big, you know? Um, and my teacher, who I loved, my, this, like one of my favorite teachers of all time, um, she was like, oh, Nina, there's this thing called a thesaurus, and there's, other <laughs> and there's other words for big, like immense. And it just like totally exploded my mind, you know? And I was just like, God, so this idea, the, like the word immense, um, and the possibility of like, I don't know the power and and complexity of language. Um, so it was like that kind of moment, and it was also just like you know loving loving to read. Um, and so no, I definitely never in my like youth was like I would like to be a carpenter, but I certainly like sort of since the beginning wanted to be a writer, for sure. Any other questions? Awesome. Uh, what are you working on next? Yes. Okay. So um, I did. I wrote a series of essays for the Paris Review about the summer solstice, and that um, is actually going to be a book that is going to come out in May, which is very soon. Um, that uh, and that felt like a real lucky break. A publisher, Godin, um, uh, has an imprint called Black Sparrow Press, which used to do like a lot of um, sort of beat stuff. They made these really beautifully produced books, um, and they're it's getting revivified. And so this is going to be one of the first titles in the sort of revivified Black Sparrow Press, which I feel like deeply excited about. They were essays I felt quite proud of. Um, and so they, when they reached out and said, you know, do you have any plans for these? I was quite psyched. I have. I have an idea for a next bigger project, which I, I, I won't talk too much about because I feel a little cagey about it, but it's kind of a blurring, a fiction and nonfiction blurring and will require a lot of research. Yeah. How mysterious. I know, yeah, how mysterious. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. To be, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. You just did a mashup between um, mythology and romance tale. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, that's cool. It's like, it's, I mean, they're all kind of mashups, you know? I think all these stories are that kind of, like, there is this sort of, this combo, this real, like, like, The Metamorphosis is a really sensual book. And so it's all, it's all there, you know? It's, and like, all the sort of love and sex and jealousy and this sort of, like, sort of primal human urges and flaws are all there and so it's sort of like it kind of came naturally because I think it sort of naturally exists in those stories um but it was I don't know that that idea of that sort of like that combo like that's I mean that was that felt playful and fun that aspect of it you know and it wasn't sort of this conscious like all right now I'm going to take this and this it just sort of like this is the way that it kind of came out and these stories do move a lot toward through time. Like you have some things mm-hmm. that are very much like set in this sort of pre-humanity or pre-civilization God space. Yeah. And then, you know, people are passing out in 7-Eleven. So like, <laughs> right, how, right. how's that happening? Like, well, how's that time work? Yeah. I mean, that was, as I was working on it, like I was just, I would sort of read the stories and then kind of listen to the voices in my mind of the, of the women, sort of how they spoke. And, and, and some would just kind of speak in the way that you and I would all speak 
together right now and some did sort of just like position themselves in a more like I don't know it's like sort of an epic register in my mind you know this sort of mythic timeless atemporal atmosphere um and that was just kind of like it was again less a conscious decision like okay Arachne you know who gets turned into a spider for her arrogance I don't it's like I'm not going to make her it wasn't like deliberate, like, all right, she's going to be modern. It was like, okay, when I heard her voice, it was, it was modern. Awesome. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? Great. Heidi's got the mic. Your last reading reminded me of a <clears throat> study, a psychological study that was done recently on why women put up with being mistreated by men. Wow. Uh -huh. And it all, all boiled down to sex. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's still, yeah, it's, it, the whole book. it's not mythical. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, I'll try to be short. I was at the library, the main library, the other day, and all the Shakespeare books were moved to the side, and the shelves were empty. So, uh, the Shakespeare shelves, uh, the whole length of the room, practically. And I went over to the librarian, and I said, uh, well, what's going to happen? Are there going to be books put there? And he said he thought there was a plan that all the books on the freestanding shelves would be removed and that only the books on the sides and in the balconies would stay, like the year 1927 when the library was built, 92 years ago. So um, I was totally shocked, mm -hmm. and I asked Tom Nichols of Free Press to investigate this. But I feel like that might be the trend that the, the books are going to be removed because people aren't uh, taking them, uh, aren't borrowing them. Wow. What's mm -hmm. your opinion? Wow, that's, I mean, that's, that's chilling in some ways. Um, gosh, I, you know, I don't read on a Kindle or e-reader. I, you know, I really, I, I like to hold the book in my hand. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, gosh, given the force of, the behemoth that is Amazon, given people reading on devices. I think, like, I guess in some ways it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think that there will always, like, books are in some ways also very convenient, and I think people will also understand that libraries are, I don't think, I don't think libraries are going to stop being um, understood as useful and important. I, I hope I yeah I really I, yeah I don't think they will. Um, uh, the fact that you can go in and say like I'm gonna like borrow this book that's a, like it's just like almost in some ways like so simple and so amazing. Um, so I guess I would I'm gonna maintain an optimistic outlook, and that like there might be again there might be sort of a shift there might be sort of like okay this is gonna get shifted this is gonna get changed you're gonna see less in this way but more in other ways. Um, but I don't think libraries are gonna go away and I do think I do really believe that people are gonna like actually keep holding books is my optimistic take an excellent segue uh, we have both of these available um, back there and I believe that Nina will be happy, happy to sign, to sign. Uh, at the end of this so uh, let's all give Nina a round of applause Thanks. thank you so much for coming uh, these are two fantastic books please Get them, yeah. read them, enjoy them, <laughs> as I have. Awesome. Thank thanks you guys again. for coming. Thank you, Allie. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, these...